here we are, session number two in Pastoral Letters. And last time we were together, we were talking about the call of God. Listen to the four things that we said about it. It's by commandment. So God isn't suggesting his calling for you. He commands you to walk in that which he's called you to do. And then it's by the will of God, not your own will, but his will. That calling is holy. And we also said that it's according to his purpose. There's something he's wanting to accomplish with our lives by saying yes to him. And so then I want to talk about signs of a divine call. Because there are things that have been going on, probably some of you, even since your childhood. First of all, a sensitivity and appetite for spiritual things. Uh, I can remember my next door neighbor was a boy named Bubba. Now, you would imagine that from Alabama, a boy named Bubba. And actually, his name was Kerry Abbott. And he and I were best friends. I was six, he was five, and we would hide in the doghouse and talk about angels and demons and about <laughs> things in the spiritual world. I had such an appetite to understand. Of course, my parents separated us when they realized we were talking about subjects too deep for six-year-olds. But there's that desire, yearning for spiritual things. A desire to impart things you know about God to others things that you've learned, you want to share it and pass it on. There's also a special charisma, and I'm careful about that word because I have a call in my life, and I wouldn't say I'm a very charismatic person because sometimes we kind of associate with charismatic as sensational, but there's a sense of drawing people. There's people who are drawn to you, and the book of Proverbs chapter 18 verse 16 tells us, that a man's gift brings him before great men. It's amazing how that gift that God puts inside of you will draw other people. And then, of course, your compassion moves you to minister to hurting people. Somehow your heart is just drawn to go help people who are hurting or in a bad way or the down and outers. You somehow just have a compassion that goes beyond just having, well, I, I really hate they're going through that, but you actually are moved to want to go help and do something about it. And then, of course, when you speak, you speak with a sense of authority. They were all amazed with Jesus that he spoke with authority. And it's very clear and not as the scribe, because the scribes would say, well, it could mean this, or it could mean this, or it could mean this, and they give you 27 options about what a particular passage in the Old Testament might mean <laughs> and kind of let you choose because they haven't done the study themselves to come to conclusions. And so that these are just some signs. Uh, it's not the only signs that you have a call of God. The first, of course, as we talked about, is that necessity laid upon you. I know I have something that God is wanting to do with my life. Now, not everybody jumps right in. Some prolong it. Others say yes right away. I was 15 when I gave my life to Christ. It was shortly after that that I surrendered my life to the ministry. Now, let me tell you, what I thought submitting my life to the ministry, I had a few options uh, in my particular denomination. When I was a part of, I was in the Baptist church, and pretty much in ministry, we had missionaries, and a lot of them did social programs, feeding the poor, so I was going to be a missionary. I also thought, well, I can be an evangelist or a pastor, but both of them have to speak publicly, and I was paralyzed of public speaking, so I had to find another one. I thought, well, I'll be a missionary, or I could be a worship leader. We called him a minister of music. So when I started college, I actually started as a music major because I was going to be a certified minister of music because at least I could be in the full-time ministry. I had no sense of everything that God was going to do with my life. And of course, the first thing I had to get past was public speaking, that fear of public speaking so that I could actually walk into it. Now, we're going to talk about the qualifications of church leadership. Here we have this call. Then there's some qualifications. And the list is pretty extensive that Paul gives us. 
but he's going to talk about three kinds of leaders in these three epistles. He's going to talk about, he's going to use the term bishop, and we talked about both Timothy and Titus being bishops, which really just means overseer or superintendent, somebody who oversees, and that might be one church, that might be many churches. Then, of course, an elder. That's a spiritual leader, and by definition, it means a mature one. So there needs to be some sense of growing into the maturity of being a leader. And then, of course, a deacon, which is a servant, one who waits on tables. We don't use the designation deacon in our particular church. And people say, well, why don't you have deacons? I said, we got a lot of deacons because we got a lot of people who serve because that's what the word means, one who serves. And so these are all a part. And, of course, we have a whole course on practical ministry. So if you've been with Pastor Jeremy, he's talked to you about the ministry of helps, uh, which isn't a diminished gift or calling. It's a very special and important part of the calling in the body of Christ. But let's look at this list. First Timothy and your notes, if it says First Timothy 2, it should be First Timothy 3 and verses 1 through 13. He gives a long list of qualifications for ministers, and it's going to list the bishop or the overseer and also the deacons or the servants. So he's going to give some specifics about that. But Timothy, uh, and then Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Listen to this long list here. Blameless, which one who has nothing an adversary can take a charge. Paul would write, give no place to the devil. And how many times and how many disappointments have we had in the church because a church leader fell? Because they left the door open for charges against them. That could be financial. That could be improprieties with the opposite sex. It could be a list of other things. But we want to be blameless. It says the husband of one wife. Now, some denominations have handled that particular passage by saying you can't be in the ministry if you've been divorced. Really, he's speaking about polygamy here, that we're not going to have two wives or three wives, and I'm not indicating you ought to have five or six, one at a time, but the fact is, where you are right now, I wrote in my dissertation on evaluating a model of teaching biblical principles of marriage to Generation X, trying to deal with the biblical principle. When I talked about divorce, I said it's sad that the church is treating the divorce divorce as if it's the unpardonable sin. You can be forgiven for your past mistakes. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Enough said there. The husband of one wife. So you don't have one or two or three. And wives don't have one or two or three husbands. That would be more than you could handle anyway because us guys are kind of tough to deal with. Also be vigilant or temperate. Having a strength of self-control. So the leader's got to work on his or her self-control. Also be sober, which means to be self-disciplined. A proper restraint on desires and have a sound mind. So remember how we said, don't let your gifts carry you further than your character can keep you. These are all character traits that you build into your life. To be temperate and self-controlled and self-disciplined. Also of good behavior, which means modest, orderly, decent uh, in the way you behave. Given to hospitality, phileoxenia, a love of strangers. Which, by the way, is opposite of xenophobia. (laughs) Where you hate strangers or you have prejudice against strangers. He says, no. Be a person of hospitality. You take people in. You accept people. He also set out to teach. So that, when we talked about that, part of the evidence of a call, I want to share what I know to other people about God. And then, of course, not given to much wine. So you don't need to be getting drunk. It's sad in the Catholic Church, and I pastored in a town 19 years where there was a lot of Catholics there. Matter of fact, over 100 years ago, about 120 years ago now, the Catholics bought 2,000 acres 
and, ba and bought several blocks downtown. And actually, at that time, it wasn't a downtown. But they actually bought a thousand acres for the priest and a thousand acres for the nuns and I should say monks. Some of them were retired priests that stayed at the monks' facility. And they had quite a bit of things going on there. And I had a friend who I led to the Lord. He got saved. But he talked about the drinking parties he used to go over and have with the priest. And, you know, in the, even their communion services, this has probably changed. I don't know all the inner workings of that, but at least in this Catholic community that I was a part of, and it is part of their theology, that when you prepare the Mass elements and you pour the wine, the wine cannot be poured out because in their theology, it becomes the blood of Christ. So you would be disrespectful to pour it out. So they had to drink it all. Well, let's make it a little extra. And that's sad what they actually did because I was that confirmed also by an altar boy uh, who grew up in the church who told me that was going on. So he's saying, hey, you're a leader of the church. Don't be given to much wine. Don't let substance abuse command your life. Because remember, you got to be sober-minded. And so... To be sober-minded, I can't give my mind over to things and substances that are going to keep me from being sober-minded. No striker. And he's going to use a similar word later, but as quarrelsome person. Be gentle and considerate. Reframe the way you talk to people. Even we've got, we got a whole section on dealing with conflict that Paul gives instructions about. There is going to be conflict, and there are going to be very difficult situations that need to be discussed. But here he's telling us, don't be a striker, a quarrelsome person, gentle and considerate, not greedy for money. It's not all about money. We've got a whole section that Paul gives instructions about how finances are to be treated in the church. And then, of course, be patient, gentle, fair, moderate, not insisting on the letter of the law. Because it's so easy for us to get legalistic. And that's why we need to be patient with other people. And then we use the word no striker, but he also says not a brawler. And that's really, again, being quarrelsome or ready to get in a fight with somebody. Not covetous. So I'm not going to lust after others. And I'm not going to be covetous about the church down the street. Because I'm a leader. And I'm about the kingdom expansion. One who rules his own home has his house in order, has his children in subjection. And really, for me, this was really something that Steph and I committed to many years ago because we were in full-time ministry by the time we were 21 and 22 years old. And we already had a baby and was about to have a second. And... We, in that full-time ministry, committed that God was going to be first, family was going to be second, and ministry would be third. And we were actually counseled that way by the leader of our school, which really was the best counsel we ever could have gotten. Because there's a lot of ministers who think their ministry is the same as their relationship with God. But my relationship with God is me and God, then my family. But what I do in the ministry is what I do for God. And my first ministry is to my family. And that was a commitment that we held to. That was important to us. So when we say get your children in subjection, maybe you enter in the ministry later in life. I know there's some wives who've had a struggle because they married a guy who now in his midlife says, I'm called to the ministry, and he changes careers. And she didn't marry a minister. Then, of course, maybe he's got teenagers who say, I didn't, marry, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a pastor's home. So there's several adjustments where that concerned. But if you'll put that order in place, I think it's going to help you a lot. Because if you have God first, family second, and so the family doesn't suffer because you're in the ministry. 
And that was one of the commitments that we made. I even told my congregation, listen, if my son's in a basketball tournament, my daughter's in a volleyball tournament, I won't be here because I'm going to be there with my kids. Somebody else in the church, another teacher in the church, another pastor on the team is going to be here, but I won't be here because my family comes before the ministry. I modeled it in front of my church. Then also, not a novice. So we're talking about being a bishop here or being a leader in the church. You're not a novice. And that's one newly come to the faith. In other words, if you just got saved, you're probably not going to be leading the church next tomorrow. It's going to be some time of development. Well, you can see all this character development that's got to take place in your life. So there's a little bit of work to be done. You're not in a rush, but now don't lag behind either. Become a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, but don't put in a novice in a place of leadership. And then of a good report outside of the church. So it's not just I do my church thing and I've got all my members believing that I'm wonderful. But do I have a good testimony outside of the church? Or am I Mr. Goody Two-Shoes in the church and I'm a jerk outside the church? No, he's saying we got to have it inside and out. And then, not double-tongued. Another way to say that is just speak the truth. Hold faith in a pure conscience. These are all list of qualifications, and we're just down to 19. So these, these are all a part of spiritual development. That's why in our curriculum, we actually have the spiritual growth component, the Bible knowledge, and the practical ministry. Because we want to be sure that you're developing spiritually along the way. And that's why we have courses on foundations of faith and prayer and the Holy Spirit and his gifts. Because we want to be sure you're developing internally. And then, of course, faithful in all things. That faithfulness is so critical. I think it, it's one of the defining things that I look for when I'm looking for leaders is, do they show up? I had a sweet lady. She was a doctor's wife in my church, and her and the doctor left my church because she was so frustrated that I didn't put her in our Sunday school program to be a teacher. But she came one Sunday a month, and we had Sunday school every Sunday. So although she probably was a great qualified teacher and would have been a great blessing to our church, I couldn't give her the role that required every week when she only came once a month. And so that faithful in all things, and of course Jesus was big on that because he distributed the five gifts, the two gifts, and the one gifts, and he came back, and his commendation were those who were faithful. And you've been faithful over a few things, you're going to be made ruler over many things. And then we're almost done with a list of 25 qualifications listed in Timothy and Titus. Not self-willed. And what did Jesus say at the cross? Not my will, but thine be done. It's not about me having my way. It's about having his way. And then, of course, not soon angry. James chapter 1, verse 19 says, The wrath of man does not bring forth the righteousness of God. Well, we all know that. But being angry. The Bible says we can be angry. And he gives that command in <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. But listen to what he said. Then he takes all the fun out of it. Be angry and sin not. So really, we don't want to be quick to anger. Soon to anger. And then, of course, be just. Be comfortable in what's right. I'll tell you, I taught my children this. Do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because you have to do the right thing. That's being a just person. This is right. And then, of course, holy. And we talked about how holy this calling is. But holy, unpolluted with wickedness. That means if I've got vices in my life, I need to be praying about how the Holy Spirit's going to help me deal with that. I can't be addicted to pornography. I can't be running around with people who are doing wicked things. I can't be a part of that. Not because I'm too good for that, 
And here's the real twist in the Great Commission. Here we are called to go all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. we got to touch everybody, yes. But then we have another passage that says, Come out from among them, be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. How am I supposed to do that? Well, Jesus said it best in his prayer. He said, Father, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil that is in the world. It's me going to the world, but not participating in the evil of the world. That's a part of being a Christian leader. And that's where holy, unpolluted, and of course, holding fast to the faithful word. So then we go to the responsibilities of a minister. And... Okay, here's who I've got to be. Now, what is my job description? And Paul gives a few categories here that uh, you can really be begin to see how, how the job is bigger. I have often people who are so sweet to thank me for Sunday morning and for preaching on Sunday morning, and they say, wow, it's, it's, it, it, it's so great today. And then, but there are occasions where I have other pastors on staff preach. They say, well, how was it to have the week off? <laughs> I just laugh. I say, I, I usually say, well, it was really nice to hear um, Brother uh, Jeremy or Brother Daniel or Brother Frank or whoever might have been the preacher for the day and Stephanie or Heather. I'm so glad. Uh, that they preached there. It was a great message, wasn't it? But internally, I'm saying, you got to be kidding me. The pulpit on Sunday morning, that's the, that's the fun part. That's the easy part. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't study. I definitely study, and I prepare, and I listen to what God might be saying to our congregation and wants to say through me. There's a lot of work behind that. But that doesn't mean I'm off work because I didn't preach on Sunday. Here's some of the responsibilities. And Paul lists in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, uh, verses 1 through 16, listen to some of the things that he said the minister has to deal with. It says, deal with heresy and error in the church through teaching the word. So there's got to be a teaching component and there's going to be heresy or there's going to be bad teachings that come in outside the church and even inside the church. I had one of my leaders criticize me one time. He was actually one of my staff members. He said, Pastor, you just know what's going on in our church and then you preach on it. I said, God forbid that I would teach you what the Bible says about the problems that are going on in our church. I said, that's my job. I'm supposed to bring to you correction from God's word. You know, the Bible says that the, the, the scriptures, and Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16. He says the word of God uh, is inspired or breathed by the Holy Spirit and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And verse 17, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He's telling us that we're going to use the scriptures to correct problems. He also said that you are to be an example. Now, we went through all of the character traits and response or qualifications for ministry, but now he's going to give us some examples of how we do that. We're going to, in, in word or in what we say, we're going to be an example in conversation or behavior. Listen, when you're a leader, people are watching you. And if you're a leader, they're following you. And wherever you go, they're going to go. Well, whoops, our battery went out. So if you see kind of a change or a glitch in your computer, it's not you. And we have just got four more minutes in this lesson right here. But listen to what we were talking about. Because we are leaders. Consequently, Paul is writing to these young leaders, be an example. You are an example whether or not you want to be and whether or not you're aware of it. It's amazing how much people are watching you, and he's giving us those categories. He also wants you to be an example in charity 
or agape love, Dr. Teal Osborne, who Steph and I sat under uh, as early together we sat under. I heard him in Bible school because he came and spent a couple of weeks with us in Bible school. But also he then in 1982, we were at a pastor's conference and he said, pastors, I want you to come all down here. We're going to have prayer. And then he opened his arms like this, just wide as he could. And he said, pastors, don't preach with your fist. Preach with your hands open. Let them know that God loves them. Well, that's more than just your preaching style. That also has to do with how you connect with people and how you treat people. Agape love, that's unconditional love. So he said, be an example of a person of love. And then, of course, be an example in spirit. There's your character and moral qualities in faith. Maybe you've heard this verse before, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you know the verse preceding that? It says that we have people that are people of faith, and we need to follow their faith, who says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Be sure that you have a faith that people can follow. And also in purity. And we've talked about that a lot. Chastity, moral attitude toward those in who you minister. And then he says, here's some things you need to give attention to. So we're still going through the job description of a minister. You see how much of it has to do with working on yourself and who you are? Let me tell you this. God makes the man or God makes the woman before he makes the minister. So be sure you're letting God work on you as a person because that's going to be the empowerment. It's going to come from you. And so God's got to work on you. Give attention to, listen to what he gives in these instructions. And still, this is all a part of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Give attention to reading the scriptures in public are reading the word of God. Jesus did this himself in Luke chapter 4. It says, as his custom was, and he was in the synagogue, he opened the scriptures and read. He read Isaiah. And we now know Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. But he read the scripture and it was his custom to read the scriptures publicly. I hope that you always turn to the word of God. We're going to end this lesson right here, but I would like for you to go back to where we started and read the scriptures that are in these lessons that we're talking about, that we've talked about in this session, and then give some comments. You're probably watching by YouTube. There's a comment section where you can actually put some comments in. Then our director, Carolyn, can know that you're not only connected, but that you're growing. May the Lord bless you.